I've entitled this Glimpsing the Glory, Paul's Gospel, Righteousness, and the Beautiful Feet of N.T. Wright. <laughs> how then shall they call upon one in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear of him without a herald? And how shall they act as heralds unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. My first week of high school was traumatic. I'd humiliated myself the first day by confiding to my mellow yellow classmates of the late 1960s that I wanted to study Latin because it was the first step to reading the New Testament in the original Greek. <laughs> yep, that had evoked a titter of amusement, but it was nothing compared to what followed. I had ensconced myself, all five foot eight eager beaver of me, in the very front row. Spellbound by the British accent and the antics of my Latin teacher, I had forgotten about the length of my legs sprawled out before me. Mr. Glazen was traversing the space between his desk and ours, waxing eloquent about Roman epic poetry. Arma, Warumqua, Cano, Troiae, Qui, Primus, Aboris, and how he would prepare us to read it. He made a sharp pirouette as he came to the side row, recommenced his pacing, and tripped over my clod hoppers. McEwen, he intoned, you have big feet. Big, fat feet. I was undone. This was the cruelest blow because he could never have known it. Mine were size 11 with E, and at 13 with an adorable cheerleader to the right of me, that made for shame. My mother was not helpful when she recounted her youthful encounter in Ireland with a man who had remarked, well, me we gel, if ye fall doon, it won't be for want of props to hold ye up. <laughs> I am much comforted that in Isaiah and in Romans, beautiful feet have less to do with size and shape, but more with direction and alacrity. This insight was confirmed as I sat at the feet of my mentor and friend, the then Reverend Dr. N.T. Wright, during graduate studies at McGill. Academics in Canada often wear sandals with socks, woolen socks, during the teaching season, so I really have no acquaintance with Bishop Tom's feet per se. As this audience knows, however, his proclamation of the gospel was and is beautiful in both manner and content. He has directed numerous ears and hearts towards the one upon whom we should call. Into many fields his feet have ventured, and his trumpet has been carefully tuned to a variety of contexts, but always it gives a certain note, Jesus, the Messiah, crucified and risen, is Lord of all. Some scholars, when they produce two versions of their work, appear to be performing a kind of a confidence trick. Usually the academic work comes first, and then it's judiciously dumbed down for the non-specialist. Bottom line decisions are emphasized, but the line of argument is obscured with a verifying nod in footnotes to the earlier, more academic tome. One can hardly blame academics for this procedure since arguments between specialists are notoriously hard to translate. In contrast, however, Bishop Tom authentically has walked in two worlds, sometimes beginning the publication of his thoughts on the popular level because what he has to say concerns them as much as the academy. There are many who would disagree with the recent indictment of John Piper that the bishop's Biblical analysis, here I'm quoting, leaves many ordinary folk not with the rewarding aha experience of illumination, but with a paralyzing sense of perplexity. On the contrary, I've discovered that when we begin with Wright's presentation of the gospel, and I discovered this in talking to students, when we center upon God's action in Jesus, then the teaching on righteousness falls into place without vulnerability to this charge of abstruseness. To be sure, those with a particular formation find themselves perplexed since they applaud the bishop's trenchant, 
critique of certain liberal or revisionist arguments, but they find themselves challenged in matters that contradict their earlier education. Consider as an illustration a potential donor to the seminary where I work, who informed a poor, bemused first-year seminarian on the telephone with him, when you can tell me the difference between the active and passive suffering of Jesus, then I may consider a donation. Alas, even if this student had mastered this in-house reform debate, her challenger had no intent really to pursue the matter beyond using it as a shibboleth. For those not so confined, however, N.T. Wright's construal of dikaiosune is not an academic question. So where did the feet of N.T. Wright go? First, they ent enter into the ancient world and the text, especially the scriptures, which this herald invokes as a lamp to his feet and a light to mark the path. Secondly, they've gone into the camp of the faithful into debate among other New Testament scholars, including those who also bear the label New Perspective, and into the tangled field of the public arena. These multivalent feats show the bishop's conviction that, though the scriptures are the library of the church, they are also open to public reading and discussion. The incarnate word has come into our space-time world. There is, however, a particular set of questions that emerges when the community of faith reads this work. We will begin with his treatment of the gospel and the righteousness of God, move on to apocalyptic language, especially as it relates to the doctrine of the ascension, and then close with his stance as scholar and leader. Throughout, we'll see how Bishop Tom moves beyond his brief as historian, literary critic, and wise church leader assuming the role of psychopomp, that is, encouraging us, like C.S. Lewis's energetic reaper further in, if not further up, to catch a glimpse of glory. If at a few points I endeavor to point out where these beautiful feet may have misstepped or halted, I don't know whether it's funny after the fact. I'm not doing this, honest. <laughs> Um, if at a few points we, uh, we've, uh, I point out where I think that these feet have faltered, perhaps misstepped, please interpret this as a clumsy service to wash the feet of the saints or to further our bold concourse with each other as siblings in Christ face to face. So first, righteousness. I was, when I met Bishop Tom, a young Salvation Army officer trained to share the gospel by using such booklets, yes, as the Four Spiritual Laws. But I was also a newly minted, avid pro-lifer, impressed by the spiritual vitality of Roman Catholic friends. I was chagrined that I had learned about this urgent response from gospel people and from a gospel perspective from those who did not have assurance of their salvation because they believed in works righteousness. Their love for Jesus and their fruit was manifest. What sense was I to make of this? Given the bridge characteristics of Anglicanism, it's hardly surprising that my dilemma was addressed by a then youngish Anglican priest scholar. For me, he was like the Levites in Joshua who marked where the river bottom was firm so that God's people might take memorial stones, celebrating the saving act that God himself had wrought. We must let scripture be scripture, he insisted, permitting the Bible to retain its mystery even when it opposes our neat interpretive schemas. Bishop Tom discerns that the Pauline gospel is the proclamation of Jesus as Lord, and that the righteousness of God is God's very own righteousness, not a statement about us, whether by imputation, impartation, or infusion. This very one is himself the Lord, who has shown forth the magnificent righteousness of God a God faithful to his covenant, as we hear in Daniel 9, and consistent in all that he says and does. Here was the answer then to my dilemma concerning Catholic friends. Salvation is by the actions of God in Jesus, whom we recognize as the Lord who has died and has been raised. It is the Lord who saves, not our knowledge. We are Christians, not Gnostics. But some have worried that N.T. Wright has compromised the gospel in building upon the insights of Jimmy Dunn and Ed Sanders. Astonishingly, one critic complains that Bishop Tom does not spell out what he means by the lordship of Jesus. 
He seizes upon a paragraph in the bishop's work that he considers to be a summary description of lordship. In this passage, however, Bishop Tom is describing the result of the proclamation about the Lord, the liberation of men and women and the formation of a community of love. So having confused the result of the gospel with its content, it's no wonder that Venema then complains that Bishop Tom emphasizes ecclesiology over soteriology. But he's missed the point. In fussing about the reconfiguration of justification, Many miss that the first plank in Wright's reading of St. Paul is neither ecclesiology nor soteriology, but Christology and theology. Bishop Tom demonstrates by way of 1 Corinthians 8 and Philippians 2 that to say Jesus is Lord means that the Son with the Father is worshipped and afforded the name. St. Paul's Gospel is about this very identification of Jesus with the Old Testament Lord. The crucified and risen Messiah is far greater than Israel could ever have imagined, and to him every knee must therefore bow. Critics also fail to see how Wright combines the insights of Dunn and Sanders without following their views slavishly. Moreover, they don't follow the bishop's arguments through, for example, Romans 9, 10, and 11. There we are shown how Israel tried to establish her own righteousness by means of the works of Torah. Dunn interprets these as circumcision, Sabbath, and kosher laws. And as a result, Israel missed out on the great incarnation of God's own righteousness among them in Jesus. Because they don't carefully follow the lines of Wright's own exegesis, they do not see the use that Bishop Tom makes of these other scholars. These, are, these scholars are helpful in establishing the character of Judaism at the time of Jesus, so that the righteousness of God can be seen in all its glory. The proclamation of the gospel, Jesus, the crucified and risen Messiah is Lord, illumines God's righteousness and faithfulness towards his people. In Bishop Tom's understanding of God's righteousness and of justification, we see two great treasures. First, a sturdy defense of the distinction between God and the creation. Second, a robust sense of reality. Point one is key to worship. Protestants need to be reminded that if we are saved on the basis of our own faith, then faith and deed can become a work. The very trap that we have sought to avoid has ensnared us. We become captive to what could be called fideism. Moreover, if the gospel is all about righteousness credited or imparted to me, then the scriptural narrative of the gospel is really all about me, not about a mighty God whose arm has saved. We need in this individualistic age a sturdy defense of the difference between God and me. We're not evangelical Maria's singing, I have confidence in confidence alone. <laughs> the second factor, his robust sense of reality has made some nervous, thinking that Bishop Wright is importing works righteousness back, through the, uh, through back into the argument through the back door. He insists that we have to read the whole of Romans, including bits that talk about a future judgment based upon our deeds. Scripture must be heard to say what it actually says, even when there are puzzling paradoxes. We cannot excise the statement, God will render to each according to his or her works, in order to highlight the declaration that a person is justified apart from works of Torah. The works of Torah do not justify, but the fruit of our lives, continuous perseverance in well-doing, is to match what God has said in acquitting us. What God declares about us in the present, that we are righteous, must cohere with what is actually true of us in the future, or God is not a righteous judge. In the last days, what is known within the household of faith will become public knowledge, clear for all to see because we will share in the glory of Christ. But this comes by way of Jesus, not by way of the law. God is not engaging in make-believe. What he says actually will come to pass. 
We're indebted to Bishop Tom for putting righteousness, faithfulness, and faith in their proper places. Those who take the time to read through his treatment of various passages will see that he's not dismissing the importance of human faith, but giving it content. We are called to see faith, we are called to faith in the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Nor will we be led back into thinking that we can earn God's favor, for God is the righteous one who shows his faithfulness in Jesus and calls us into new life. Bishop Tom's insistence that we let God be God and Scripture be Scripture is salutary both for a church community that has devolved into sentimentality and for Christians who have all unwitting made doctrinal knowledge or human confidence into works that avail before God. It is because of what God has done in Christ that we have, in Bishop Tom's own words, been enabled to become the truly human beings that we are meant to be. We glimpse the glory. But here I must pause, stopping for a brief moment to ask whether we might have glimpsed even more had our theological Virgil not been quite so rigorous in maintaining his very important distinctives. Yes, we must maintain the difference between the righteousness of our divine judge and his declaration that we may be because of Jesus in the right. Yes, a judge never gives his own justice to the defendant even when the pleader is declared innocent. But there are hints in the Gospels and the letters that we are not in any ordinary courtroom. For God's courtroom is also his throne room and temple, and where the glory of the Lord abounds, strange things happen. The astonishing nature of these goings-on is intimated in that perplexing verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. He has made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Does this constitute an Achilles heel? for the beautiful feet of N.T. Wright and his argument about dikaiosune theo? I don't believe so. Rather, this is the exception that proves or demonstrates the rule. In virtually every case of Paul's letters, God's righteousness remains his very own. But here, St. Paul associates the righteousness of God with humanity, the we. Bishop Tom mitigates the shock by reference to apostolic activity. St. Paul and the other apostles incarnate or embody God's dikaiosune as they proclaim God the Reconciler. After all, chapter 2 through 5 of 2 Corinthians has mounted a defense of Paul's apostolic mission. Bishop Tom's reading, I think, however, does not heed all the rich nuances of this extended passage, nor does it fit perfectly with the immediate argument in chapter 5. Certainly the apostle has had need to defend his apostleship among the Corinthians. However, the situation in chapters 3 to 5 is similar to that other more impassioned oration in 2 Corinthians 11 through 13. And there, Paul asked the rhetorical question, do you think that all along we have been defending ourselves? And the answer that he wants to hear is no. His foundational purpose has not been to mount an apologia, but to build up the Corinthians. Similarly here, Paul has indeed compared himself to Moses, dubbed the Corinthians his own letter of recommendation, alluded to vulnerability, reminded them of his suffering, but he has also spoken of the unveiled faces of all of the transformation of all, of the light shining in our hearts over against the blindness of unbelievers, of all of us who must appear before the judgment seat and who hope for the resurrected life. Indeed, in the verses just prior to the one in question, Paul has been talking about Christ dying for all and about anyone in Christ and about all things becoming new. We must remember that the we in Paul is notoriously difficult here as in Ephesians. In the context of statements about all and all things, it's not likely that this phrase can be tamed by a plea of extravagant language concerning apostolic proclamation. 
Could the same Paul who has contrasted the old covenant and new by juxtaposing Moses' privileged illumination over against the transfiguration of the whole church, could that same Paul really intend to limit incarnational language to the apostolic ministry? Also, consider the lack of congruity here. Christ was made sin so that, simply so that, the apostles could show forth God's righteousness. In such a construal, the shock of the first part of the sentence, Christ made sin, does not match the functional quality of the second. No, if Christ was made sin, it could hardly be for the purpose of the apostolic charism. Instead, Paul indicates a miracle that makes its impact upon all in the new creation. To read 2 Corinthians 5.21 as a mystery does not undermine all that has been argued rightly about God's very own righteousness. The logic is much like that of our Christian story. The incarnation can only overwhelm those who have firmly grasped the distinctness of a holy God. It would be ho-hum for a polytheist. It is the God-man who assumes death and sin in order to win life and righteousness for God's people. It is he who stands as judge and advocate and as defendant. What life is there except that of God, the giver of life? What righteousness is there except God's very own? God does not give grace. God gives his very self. In continuity with the theme of glory in 2 Corinthians 2 through 5, here in this verse we encounter in Nuce, the doctrine that would later come to be known as theosis. We glimpse the glory of what human beings are meant to become at the very point where the exception proves the well-taken rule of right. Indeed, this interpretation sets us up perfectly for chapter 6, which speaks about our call to light, holiness, righteousness, and fellowship. One is holy, one is righteous, one is Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, holy things are for the holy. This isn't contractual, it's a mystery, going beyond theories of righteousness. We anticipate a deepening communion with the Holy Trinity, our full transformation into the likeness of that one who is the very image of the Father. Who could have envisioned the large room in which God intends to set our feet? This is what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor feet traversed, nor the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. On to apocalyptic. Apocalyptic language is one way in which the unimaginable is conceived. As a student of GB Caird, Bishop Tom has been both hailed and critiqued for his approach, especially with regards to the use of apocalyptic language in talking about the historical Jesus. Here, the bishop falls the strategy of the master debater who accepted for argument's sake the foundation of the Sadducees, and he still confounded him. I'm thinking of Matthew 22, where Jesus argues from Torah rather than from the Sadducean rejected book of Daniel that there was a resurrection from the dead. Bishop Tom likewise crushes the lion of literalism and the adder of skepticism using the canons of literary and historical criticism. Jesus was no failed apocalyptic visionary, but he himself it is argued, used apocalyptic metaphor with teeth, investing what seemed to be ordinary political and historical events with theological meaning. By means of historical method, Bishop Tom also boldly goes where many historians have never gone before. No laughs. No Star Trek here. I'm getting old. This is really sad. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Bishop Tom asked pointed questions concerning that apocalyptic event that occurs in mid-time, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, that event that left imprints in time that need to be considered. His cogent argument in the resurrection of the Son of God, that cognitive dissonance cannot account for the proclamation that the earliest Christians had that Jesus was alive, that kind of argument is absolutely welcome. In Wright's accounting, 
Jesus' vocation as son of man, man and also suffering servant, that vocation is vindicated in Jesus' own resurrection and in the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. The Son of Man coming with the clouds to the Ancient of Days is not therefore an expectation of the end of the space-time universe, nor even a reference to Jesus' future parousia, but a symbolic way of saying that Jesus expects to be publicly vindicated. Bishop Tom faces the challenge of Schweitzer, mooring Jesus firmly in his Jewish environment, but not agreeing that Jesus was therefore mistaken. Instead, the great future event of resurrection is brought into the midst of human history. Apocalyptic is part of the repertoire, the arsenal of the prophetic Jesus. All this is enormously helpful. Yet I remain uncomfortable with the somewhat reductive definition of apocalyptic. What does apocalyptic language do? Bishop Tom's explanation assumes a kind of rhetorical artifice, rather like his own masterful vision in that wonderful tale about Michelle that he told against Dom Crossan. In the New Testament, in the people of God, he speaks about the necessity of judging each apocalypse individually to determine whether it reflects a mystical vision or has a sheer literary quality. While he seeks to appreciate the polyphony of apocalyptic passages, Bishop Tom describes Jesus as encoding or decoding an entire theology by means of his words and actions. My own work with apocalypses makes me uneasy about his suggestion that we are to defang apocalyptic symbols as merely political and not also to receive them as pointers to heavenly and future realities interconnected with our own lives. It's a matter of the direction of the reference and the taming of the symbol. Sometimes it is clear the apocalypsis did write literary facsimiles of visions for theological and political purposes. But other apocalyptic passages bring us into touch with the mystical, with the inexpressible. The apocalypse mediates another world, another time, another reality, and thereby invests the world with meaning. Our lives, Israel's life, the church's life takes on importance because they partake of a larger than human life reality. More is happening than seems to be happening, as Father Patrick Reardon puts it in his little book on Job. I want then to affirm what Bishop Tom affirms without denying what he denies. This sounds like a chorus, doesn't it? How many times have we heard that today? Consider C.S. Lewis's words on the Ascension, in which Lewis argues that we cannot be certain where the metaphor leaves off and reality begins. It won't do to say that a physical going up has nothing to do with returning to God until we've been there. We can't be certain which part of the picture is sheer window dressing and which part partakes of the reality which we have not yet seen. Yes, Jews of Jesus' day did speak of the sun and moon being darkened in reference to historical events. And Ezekiel used resurrection language to re refer to the return from exile, but we know that the resurrection was not conceived of simply symbolically in Jesus' own day. Similarly, if one's expecting a cosmic remaking, as Paul does in Romans 8, and a new heavens and a new earth in Hebrews, Peter, Revelation, and other places, then one surely expects a cosmic death first. Try as I may, I cannot symbolize the language found in 2 Peter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the wor works that are upon it, will, upon it will be burned up. There's no room for scattered showers elsewhere in this one. The Petrine vision squares with Jewish vision, such as those found in 1st Enoch and 4th Ezra. It looks, after all, as if some Jews in Jesus' day, some anyway, did anticipate the actual end of the world, though perhaps not imminently. However, there is within Bishop Tom's argument a clue as to the appropriate connection of the Son of Man who comes to the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man who will return. This is the resurrection of Jesus himself. Just as the resurrection of Jesus took everyone by surprise, so the judgment of Israel and the fall of the temple may be seen as the judgment of God upon the world put back into history. 
The Jews looked for a general resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is God's own confirmation and also shaking up of that hope. Similarly, the events of 70 AD are God's prints upon history, assuring us of the reality of final judgment. But after judgment, resurrection. And so in history, when Israel after the flesh cedes to the new Israel, there is Christ's body, which includes Jew and Gentile. Yet, we still await a heavenly city when God's bride, completely purified and fulfilled, is revealed and there is a marriage of heaven and earth. I am, of course, using typological interpretation, a method that coheres with the unusual elasticity of apocalyptic language. Jesus spoke of the coming historical trial of Israel in apocalyptic terms, but these events participated in cosmic events which we have not yet witnessed, just as Jesus' own resurrection is bound up with God's final purposes of resurrection for all his people. Jesus saw Satan fall from heaven, symbolized in the successful mission of the 70 disciples, but an indication also of the final defeat of the one who has been bound already by the final parousia of the Son, but there is a final completion to come. The first referent in Jesus' apocalyptic word in Mark 13 and the parallel passages was indeed the coming ordeal in Judea, but that does not exhaust its meaning. The redirection of this language to speak of the return of the one who called himself son of man did no violence to the original teaching. Rather, it was latent in the language itself. So St. Paul already echoes Jesus' words when he anticipates Jesus being revealed with the angels when he comes on that day. By the time of Justin, Matthew 24 is being read as a promise of the second coming. And in the Sermons of the Golden Mouth, St. John, we see common sense Antiochian interpretation that applies 24 to the events of 70 AD, but then appeals to Acts 1.10 as the link which help, was helpful to us as we read these verses in terms of Jesus coming on a cloud as he was taken up. The events are conceptually linked because they are pointers and they are pictures of and pointers to the ruling king vindicated and acting for his people. Besides, there are a lot of interconnected comings and goings. Though the Son of Man in Daniel goes to the Ancient of Days, Bishop Tom reminds us also about the owner of the vineyard coming to his land and God returning. There is then an upward and a downward direction, one attributed to the Son of Man and the other to the Almighty. Jesus personifies both the ascending Son of Man, and he is the embodiment of the Lord's return to Zion. Assurance of God's visitation remained with the church through the Holy Spirit. Yet there is also in the New Testament, isn't there, a strain of exile. In the angelic words of Acts 1, and in those poignant redirected words about the coming of the Son of Man. The powerful polyvalence of apocalyptic language offers not simply a sign of past judgment, though it does this, but it also has a powerful word for the church today. And it does these things without robbing the words of their historical power. Let's turn to the ascension and to the Christian hope. In Surprised by Hope, Bishop Tom emphasizes resurrection over heaven, insisting on the importance of the body. In dealing with the ascension, he follows Douglas Farrow, who distinguishes between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, who highlights the taking of the human body by Jesus in the ascension event. Jesus doesn't simply disintegrate or go back to being a bodiless God. And he also emphasized the absence of Jesus as well as his presence in the Holy Spirit. The ascension prevents us from visualizing Jesus' victory as merely spiritual. It prevents us from thinking about the incarnation in temporary terms only. Beam me up, Scotty. If you keep going, you'll get it. Click again. There we go. 
It prevents us from imagining the Christian hope in terms of immaterial existence and thereby devaluing the body. And it prevents us from confusing God the Son with a spiritual presence or confusing the church with Jesus. And we've heard some of this already. To understand the ascension properly reminds us forcibly of our status as creatures and yet it, there are also hints that heaven and earth are not so very far away from each other, the bishop's own words. In dealing with the scandal of the Ascension story for our skeptical generation, the bishop follows this rule. Part of Christian belief is to find out what's true about Jesus and let that challenge our culture. When we trace Jesus' journey, we catch a view both of what makes Jesus unique, but also of what God intends for us, since Jesus is the true Israel, the new Adam. What then about the, the ascension? Douglas Farrow makes two important points helpfully picked up by Bishop Tom. First, there are two divergent histories which the church has to keep in tension, the history of the world and the history of Jesus. Secondly, we must see our life in terms not only of an ascension of the mind or the spirit, but in terms of Jesus' bodily resurrection and ascent, which brought human history to a climax and which allowed for the giving of the Holy Spirit. To think only of a mental ascent or a spiritual ascent is to allow, quote, the doctrine of the ascension to dissolve Jesus' humanity. That's a quotation from Doug Farrow's good book. Pharaoh does not dismiss outright the human ascent of mind and spirit. How could he, given the injunction of the New Testament letters to set our minds on high? However, he does view talk of spiritual ascent as suspect because it can dilute the robust Christian hope for bodily resurrection and for the actual return of Jesus. And Bishop Tom agrees. Again, I want to heed the caution of my friends but I also want not to minimize a venerable tradition that goes back to the New Testament. There are both present and future implications of Jesus' ascension. Because the Son has assumed our human nature, it is no mere fantasy that we are presently seated in heavenly places. Thus we are enjoined, set your minds on things above. Now, Bishop Tom is quite right to be disturbed about the human tendency, even among believers, to try to seize power to bring down Christ by means of spiritual prowess or institutional claims. There are certainly cases where individuals or ecclesial institutions have blurred the distinction between Christ and themselves by appealing to the Spirit. But that is not spiritual ascent in its Christian shape. There remains for the Christian the call to seek the face of the God of Jacob so that we might ascend the hill of the Lord and stand with feet in his holy place. This yearning is appropriate because a new ladder has been given. Remember, climax actually literally means ladder. This ladder is, of course, the Son of Man, who by his ascension has taken upon his shoulders our nature, which had gone astray. He is the one who brings it to God the Father. That's a song from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. When and how does our ascent take place? Well, it takes place by ascesis, by the carrying of the cross alongside Christ as each of us plays Simon of Cyrene to the one who alone can bear this burden for us. It also takes place in prayer and in worship as, to use the words of Cyril of Jerusalem, we bring to the presence of God heaven, earth, oceans, sun, moon, and the entire creation. This is not an ascent that leaves behind the world or that hopes to escape it. Instead, we offer up all to the creator and redeemer of all. How is Jesus' ascension a pattern for us? Jesus' ascension transforms what would merely have been a fall and restoration that is a V-shaped story into a story of mending plus glory, a Y or che a check mark contour. The ascension shows that all of what we are has been assumed. And so it's not our bare redemption, but our entire hallowing and exaltation that God has in mind. Now we ascend in mind and spirit to where we are by virtue of our union with Christ. We're already there seated, but 
Now we ascend in mind and, mind and spirit. And as we make this ascent together and enabled by the spirit, even our bodies and this world are not left unchanged. Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. Now in worship, in our reading of the word, and especially in our partaking of the Eucharistic mysteries, we're caught up into the heavenly places not so as to escape the world, but to present the world before the risen, slaughtered lamb who can unseal the scroll. There's a present aspect to our ascent. Is there a future one as well? Bishop Tom is right to castigate those who posit from a single verse, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the doctrine of a rapture. And he is, I believe, exactly right to envision this meeting as the church rushing to greet Jesus as he returns to judge and to remake. But does nothing happen to us when we greet our beloved? Is our ascent simply for his benefit, a human vanguard on his way to match the angels rank on rank who watch the light of lights descend? Is this ascent not also a fulfillment of our destiny, a sign of our own glorification? Is it a bodily answer to the longing of our souls, minds, and spirits to enter into his kingdom, that is, to rule with him? There are clues to this great ladder, this great climax, in the scriptures and in the Christian tradition. Revelation 11 strangely retells the story of God's two faithful, who seem to be Moses and Elijah. Elijah, you will remember, was assumed and did not die. About Moses, there are conflicting stories. The canon speaks of his death and a hidden tomb, whereas the pseudepigraphon suggests that he was assumed. Here, in the Revelation story, the two faithful, whoever they are, follow the very path of Jesus. They are martyred during their martyria, their testimony. They are mocked and they lie dead for about three days, and then they are raised and invited, come up here and they ascend in a cloud of glory, sharing in the victory of the one true witness, Jesus. Of course, there's another one of whom the historic church has had similar things to say, though her familial glory has sometimes been misunderstood or confused with the one who alone defeated death and sin. Stories like these should not undermine the uniqueness of our Lord. Rather, they underscore the great truth, the greatest truth about the resurrection. Another quotation from my own Orthodox tradition. When you fulfilled the plan of salvation for us and united earth to heaven, you ascended in glory, O Christ our God, never leaving us, but remaining ever present. For you proclaim to those who love you, I am with you and none else has power over you. I think Fewer Christians today need the lessons emphasized by Pharaoh and by Bishop Tom that Jesus is absent from us and that the church is not identical with the Holy Spirit. Rather, we need assurance that Jesus is present with us in the Eucharist and in the proclamation of the word. In worship, we're not simply practicing, but we're being taken up into all this. In our individualistic age, we are less tempted to make false mediators and to take false mediatrices than to assume, I can do this myself. The ascension sets our imagination on heavenly things and it fixes our wills upon the one who will show us while we wait for his final return, what he has for us to do, not separately, but together with the church in every time and place. In this church, every member points, though some more luminously than others, to the one who is, the only God-man. This vision harmonizes with Bishop Tom's understanding about the continued significance of this world. God intends to unite earth to heaven so that the Holy Trinity is ever present with us. Our hope is not that we should be unclothed, but further clothed, that there should be a renewed heavens and earth, though death should intervene. So shall we ever be with the Lord. If Bishop Tom says more about the further clothing, the cosmic union, and the renewal than about the purging effects of ascesis, death, and judgment than many ancient fathers of the church, that is perhaps excusable. All of us long to look beyond the valleys to the heights where our feet itch to go. 
or better yet, we yearn for the valleys to be exalted so that they too can feel the wind bringing newness of life. In the end, this is where the righteousness of God will lead, though there is a dark side too portrayed in the apocalypses and other spots of the scripture, a dark side that must not be glossed. At last, our feet are standing at your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city in one united whole. There the tribes go up, the tribes of Yahweh, a sign for Israel to give thanks to the name of Yahweh. For there are set thrones of judgment. I have one longing. I long that the feet of Bishop Tom would venture more deliberately into the world of the Church Fathers and more completely into the strange terrain of the Eastern Church. I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> Certainly he has done this more in Surprise by Hope than in previous works, and there are rumors that the bishop is using the language of theosis these days too. But there are points in his surprised book that surprised me. I did not always recognize the spin that he put on Orthodox teaching. This is, I think, because at the foundations, our friend remains a Protestant. In his own words, my only agenda is to be as close as I can possibly get to what Paul actually says, and I don't really care too much what different later Christian traditions say. Now here, I know the bishop is probably referring to much later traditions, but it is telling that he also cheerfully ignores early church fathers in, for example, his Caridian interpretation of Matthew 24, or his neglect of the purgative cosmic day that precedes the new creation. Consonant with this approach is also his strong emphasis upon freshness, as though this were the measure of scholarship and proclamation. Our age is oriented towards the novel, and we must speak so as to be heard. There's also the factor of Bishop Tom's multiple readership. Sometimes what the bishop says is no doubt intended for one set of ears and for a certain context. In assigning his little book, Who Is Jesus, over the years to students, several times a few have stumbled over the phrase, it is highly likely that the church has distorted the real Jesus, and assume that the bishop is a revisionist. He's not, of course, but his solution to distortion is only no holds barred history. As though the historian alone and not the witness of God's people as a whole were the authoritative voice as to reality. Some of these moves may be apologetic and missional, but they are vulnerable to the charges of professionalism and rank individualism, characteristics that do not match the humility of our dear friend. Asked by one of my students, where is your reading of Matthew 24 upheld by any of the church fathers? Bishop Tom replied with simplicity, I don't know. It would at the very least be an exercise in Christian koinonia for this shepherd to seek out more deliberately the counsel of his siblings of ancient days, where he will indeed find emphasis on God's own judgment, on Jesus' engagement with Israel, and on the importance of the body, and perhaps some challenges as well. Indeed, many of those with whom he's in conversation are intent to go back to an ancient future, and such a move would be welcomed by them. The call to freshness and semper reformanda is salutary for God's people. So too is the reminder that God's Holy Spirit has never abandoned his people and that he has promised to make the place of our feet glorious. By means of Bishop Tom Wright, our generation has glimpsed the exalted one whose feet alone are all glorious, and who in humility submitted to their washing and their piercing at the hands of those whom he loved. Through critique and the adulation which the bishop's vigorous work has evoked are not easy burdens to bear. And our brother continues to respond to both with balance, equanimity, and grace. Salty persons like Bishop Tom retain the admiration and the affection of both friends and opponents. In all of this, he has not lost his footing and his actions and words have served as signposts of hope pointing back to Jesus and on to the hope of glory. And that is no mean feat. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on.